I'd like to welcome you to this seminar. We have two very interesting uh, papers from our speakers. Uh, this seminar, of course, is one of six that are offered jointly by the Centre for the Study of Higher Education and the L.H. Martin Institute, six for the year. Uh, and if you uh, collect one of the brochures from the front, you will see that there is another seminar next week. Uh, the focus of the seminars is public policy and tonight we're exploring an interesting question which is the title of the seminar, Mutual Protection or Deadly Enemies? Funding Research and Funding Teaching. This is a really timely seminar I think. Today is, for some of us, a special day in that um, Today is the day that the new regulation and quality agency, TEXA, actually comes into being. So it's interesting to think about that in the context of this discussion around um, teaching and research. On another note, today is also a very important day for the gamblers, admirers of horse flesh among us. Today is first of August, of course, horse's birthday. Um, I don't know that there's any connection at all between teaching, research and horses, but there could very well be. Um, some might even say that there could be a connection between teaching, research and gambling. <laughs> uh, if you think about academic careers and questions about where do I put my energy, where do I put my effort? The question that the seminar addresses is, as I said, a very uh, enticing one. Uh, mutual protection or deadly enemies, funding research and funding teachers. The first part of the title, Mutual Protection or Deadly Enemies, suggests some sort of confrontation between research and teaching. The second part refers to funding teaching and funding research, much less confrontational, except if you look at it, you'll see that funding research comes before funding teaching. <clears throat> I'm neither a semiotician nor a linguist, but I'm sure either of those people would have a field day with the title and what might actually be hidden in it. What are the hidden meanings behind it? I actually have to say as a personal preference, I do prefer the second part of the title, uh, implying a more collaborative approach, but that's just a personal preference. The title, I think, is really very important because it does have many implications for the tertiary sector. It's important too to remember in this context that the seminars are tertiary education seminars. Some of the implications in the question apply to institutions and raise questions about teaching only, research only, the place of vet institutes in the tertiary sector, the place of research institutes in the tertiary sector. Uh, just by way of comment, uh, I came back um, this morning from uh, an accreditation exercise in Hong Kong and we were looking to see whether a private provider, a vocational provider, has the, is able to offer the academic environment that one would expect undergraduate degrees to be offered in. And that institution was quite clear that the role for academics is 80% teaching and 20% applied research and consultancy. Very interesting. And of course that suggests too that the title has implications for academic work. What is academic work? What is the relationship between teaching and research? Note too that community service doesn't get a Guernsey in the title. What does that mean, if anything? 
And when we're talking about academic work, what are the metrics that we might use to measure performance? What are the measures that might be used to identify good, excellent academic work from academic work that might not be as strong as it could be? And if it's not as strong as it could be, and we have answers to these questions in mind, what then do we do about it? There are also implications, of course, for academic and teaching careers. And I just men I mentioned one earlier. Are there choices that people need to make between teaching and research or research? Um, is it possible to be engaged in both effectively at the same time? And for how long? And when we're talking about academic careers, what are we looking at? Only a point at promotion? Or are we looking at an entire academic career over a lifetime? And what is a lifetime career in academia? It used to be 40 plus years. Is it still that? Might only be 20. Could be 15. Could be 10. Will there be movement of people in and out of academic careers? And what that, might that mean? Of course, tied up with that too are industrial matters. There are questions of identity and the ways in which academics and teachers uh, describe themselves. There are also questions around the culture of the academic profession and what it might be. And I would say too that there are gender issues in there as well. And I think that we should not forget those. Um, is the academic workforce becoming more feminised? We know what has happened to teaching and nursing over the years. Uh, so that's just a question to um, leave hanging. There are also implications, of course, for funding, which is uh, the primary focus of this particular seminar. But it's important to be aware, to be quite clear about what it is that's actually being funded. And when we're looking at funding, there's a question about what subsidised what. The um, common received wisdom is that teaching subsidises research. I assume this is, this is a reason because of the funding for academics in uh, ARC grants. But it is possible for some research projects to be funded with full cost recovery. So what does that mean? Is, is the received wisdom in fact borne out um, by the evidence? We don't yet know. Um, there are also implications for structures within the uh, sector. Think about ALTC, think about ARC. ALTC, I was talking with Richard James earlier today, and ALTC looks, well, transform is not quite the word, transmogrify. Uh, the group that, that uh, the group within DIWA that will be managing projects formerly managed by ALTC is called the Learning and Teaching Excellence Branch. So you might want to think about that um, and think about the differences between a council as in ALTC and a branch. There are implications too, finally, for the communication of successes in teaching and in learning. And when I talk about communication, I'm not thinking only about within institutions. I'm also thinking more generally to the broader community. What is it about communication, about the successes in teaching and research that will lead to enhanced confidence that communities may hold about um, tertiary institutions. We hear a lot about the teaching and research nexus and you'll see that in the description of the seminar there's mention of the teaching and research divorce. Perhaps funding takes on an additional um, dimension in that context too. But to explore the teaching and learning, teaching and research nexus and the teaching and research divorce, we have two speakers from different parts of the tertiary education sector. We have 
Martin Grabert, who's here from the Group of Eight, where he is a Senior Policy Advisor. And we also have John Maddock, who is the CEO of the Box Hill Institute. Both speakers will speak for 15, 20 minutes, uh, and then that will leave significant time for question. Uh, I will introduce each speaker after the, after the other, except one before the other. Um, and first, I would like to introduce Martin Grabert, as I said, who's from the Group of Eight, where he's a Senior Policy Advisor. He has extensive experience in science and research cooperation, and he contributes to the Group of Eight's public policy initiatives in innovation and international collaboration. From 2005 to 2010, he was Director of the European Cooperation in Science and Technology Office in Brussels. This is known as COST, C-O-S-T. Again, very relevant to our topic. COST is the longest running European organisation supporting networks among researchers across Europe and beyond. He is um, very experienced in networking and in bringing researchers into contact with each other. He, his academic background is in aeronautical engineering and he also has experience in, research, in a research unit of the Technical University Berlin in Germany. So he brings policy expertise, administrative and leadership expertise, and also expertise as an, as an academic. So Martin, welcome, and I invite you to address us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joss. Um, it is a pleasure to be here and to, to be distracted by this beautiful view behind you. I'm really in an unfortunate position here. Uh, thank you very much for this introduction, Joyce. Uh, let me start with an explanation. Those who expected Mike Gallagher here today, uh, his apologies, he was asked by the minister to accompany him to India on this uh, huge mission. Uh, taking place uh, today. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm glad to speak to you about this. I've not been involved in uh, research and research networking only uh, for a certain period uh, in my life. I also was involved in um, setting legal frameworks for tertiary education institutions in Germany, and that was a very interesting experience. So I am happy to go back to this, uh, oops, to this topic here in the context uh, which I consider very important. Um, you, that's the right one. <clears throat> The group of eight do not uh, need introduction here, I think. These universities uh, deliver an enormous part of uh, students and PhDs to a very quickly changing labor market. And they maintain this world leading position through an enormous investment, not a divorce, investment into the marriage between research and teaching. This, I think, is a prerequisite uh, just to start my talk here uh, with the footnote that the group of eight universities believe in diversity. A society cannot survive with an education pressed in one mold and the result is expected to fit all. So a diversity, I think, is the most important message one could deliver in terms of uh, formulating future tertiary education policies. I will focus here on two aspects which are eminent to the uh, group of eight universities. One the focus, as I said, and the investment on 
the teaching research nexus. And one example outflow, again, distinguishing and solidifying these activities is the group of eight QVS, uh, the quality verification system. Um, the activities here, the group of eight universities are focusing upon is to enable excellent young highly skilled people to enter into the labor market and be, so to say, ready to cope with all the challenges which a quickly changing environment, global environment, uh, faces them. Uh, therefore, the curricula in these universities are focusing on academic standards with the appropriate learning outcomes and a practical relevance of all these aspects. This requires a constant reviewing of the curricula and the research teaching nexus because all this is shifting. This is not new. I'm uh, sorry to go back uh, some time, a little more than uh, 200 years ago. Uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, uh, who was considered as the father of the newly structured universities, at least in Europe, uh, made a very interesting speech when the Humboldt University uh, was founded. And he made, I think, a very interesting distinction between a school and a university. He stated that schools treat, as he put it, closed and settled bodies of knowledge. Whereas the university is exploring the unknown. I do not want to cite Donald Rumsfeld, but certainly there are some unknown unknowns which are not solved yet and encouraging uh, further elaboration, discussion, and thinking to keep this process going. I think uh, to start a university under these premises with this distinction is very helpful actually for the uh, present debate as uh, Joyce introduced it. Uh, let me come up with a diagram I modified from Healy and Jenkins. Uh, I think there are some highly regarded uh, researchers in the uh, teaching research nexus domain. Uh, who try to categorize different activities with different outcome. They stipulate that the confrontation of students with actual research topics stimulate the creativity. That's basically it. And this stimulation happens in different phases. First, you need to learn basic instruments to engage in such a debate. This develops skills and abilities, which then leads into a discussion about actual research, leading then to the active researching activity in general. I think that this is something we should aim at in order to provide students with the capabilities which are required in today's labor market. Let me give another example that's a long text, but uh, I will come later to some uh, interesting examples based on these findings and I'm 
I think this presentation will be available for you uh, on the website. It is very important that students, undergraduate students, <coughs> are encouraged to ask unconventional questions because they themselves contribute through asking questions to develop new research aspects. Yeah, I think that's a very, very important aspect which universities should facilitate and enable what is here described as a zone of transition between the learning and the active researching students and personalities. Some examples of the universities, uh, preaching to the converted here, uh, University of Melbourne has set up the nine educational principles and in the second principle, knowledge creation, which actually is uh, research, is closely linked to the character of education offered by this research-led university. So here it's the fundamentals in the principles. We have another example, uh, University of Queensland. Practical aspects, undergraduate science students experience in research in their free time. They are invited. They are mentored by experienced researchers to find an interest and to uh, get acquainted with the methodology in research. And let me, another example, there's one more. Uh, at the end, you, you will uh, find the very elite um, unconventional studies to the PHB, which uh, is a uh, basically Bachelor of Arts, which is individually tailored for very high achievers, which is not based on the established curricula and directly research-led, as is or are the independent research projects, again, uh, high achievers here undertake self-directed research projects in their normal study course. Examples uh, how the group of eight universities try to today to implement the Humboldtian principle and to lead this to excellence in teaching based on excellence in research. To maintain the excellence in a diverse group of universities, as the group of eight is, the group of eight quality verification system becomes active actually now. It will be um, applied as of September in some faculties. The QVS is aiming at showing and securing agreed standards throughout the disciplines so that you do not have to ask the question when you get one student from one university whether this qualifies in your terms. It is guaranteed by this system that we, the uh, transparency of the contents actually is guaranteed and uh, certified by independent experts. This benchmarking, I think, is a very important aspect in teaching, because you have to know what you're talking about. I mean, many people, uh, let me just refer to the European credit transfer system, which is only 
based on hours or study time, but not on the contents. This is contents related and I think a very big achievement in securing a very high level of teaching success in these universities. I think it's a good example that has a worldwide impact in the end. Let me summarize here. The group of eight vice chancellors, or the group of eight as such, will continue to promote best practice in teaching and learning. This is uh, related to the high academic standards the universities want to provide and maintain, uh, not only in research, but directly related also in the teaching. And yeah, I think this is my part of this uh, debate here we will have later. Uh, again, diversity is, I think, the key uh, for the future debate because uh, a society cannot be put in a mold. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
What does this term mean under the new architecture? And what sense or logic is there in allocating funds under these headings only to selected institutions, namely universities? There are other rapidly expanding parts of our tertiary education sector, the so-called non-university higher education providers, which includes a group of uh, TAFE institutes and the TAFE sector itself. Earlier this year, University Australia and uh, TAFE Directors Australia, the two, two peak bodies for our sectors, saw the need to redefine tertiary education qualifications as being those at diploma level and above, including where these qualifications may embedded, be embedded pathways from the qualification levels below. So therefore, it follows that in, <coughs> in emerging recognition that integral to the teaching of diploma and above courses delivered by TAFE institutes will be an expectation of scholarship and the application that scholarship has to research. So in the education sector, scholarship and research are no longer the exclusive pro province of university as we traditionally know them. Their concepts, values and activities integral to teach our tertiary teaching and will be found in all tertiary education providers, whether they be universities or the euphemistically titled non-university tertiary, tertiary providers. The only difference is that in universities, funding is provided to support and promote scholarship and research in differing ways and to different extents, of course, than in other parts of the sector where it is not. Which turns me, it returns me to the topic, funding research and funding teaching. Has the research teaching nexus had its day, if you permit a little slight licence on the topic? The author of the synopsis of this evening's seminar would seem to have reached some conclusions about this already. The synopsis identified the decades-long trend towards research funding for specific projects increasing specialisation and the implications of this for many working academics. As the synopsis describes them, the scholarship teaching nexus beckons. I would contend that this is not unreasonable, that it is not unreasonable to generalise that today many universities academics, particularly here in Australia, are not focused on or interested in research for discovery sake, but see research as more associated with the development of their discipline knowledge and skills to maintain and improve the quality of their teaching. This is entirely appropriate and I think the generalisation can equally be applied to academics and teachers in non-university providers, that is the TAFE sector. We expect and assume our academic teaching staff will pursue research in their disciplines as an integral component of their professional teaching scholarship responsibilities. Where academics are encouraged or expected to undertake research activities with specific or uh, applied or higher uh, level approach, then we should treat and fund them accordingly as research proje uh, project academics, not as academic teachers. And in today's tertiary education world, there are increasingly divergent paths and the architects, as the seminar, uh, seminar organisers call it, should reflect enable and enable this development. That is, we should value and respect each academic researcher and each academic teacher as major contributors to our communities and societies in their own right. And recognise that while some may choose and be able to do both, I would contend that with Australia's limited population and resources and our current GDP, our country is better served by focus by our talented academic teachers and researchers. There are major structural changes underway and these will lead, in my opinion, to a further reshaping of Australia's tertiary education system in a way in which this trend is acknowledged. My own crystal ball su suggests to me that we are seeking, uh, we're seeing the system reshape itself with some pushing by the policy makers towards an outcome which will see a small number of research intensive universities, perhaps one in each state geared very much to ERA funding and postgraduate teaching. That is, a strengthening of the GO8 research intensive university, which already attracts 70% of the funding anyway. With such a move, we may see, or should see, increased resourcing for the specialist universities from government, who would need to take a prime responsibility for funding this research, with other revenue sources being of secondary support nature. And resourcing of these institutes, I would contend, should be on a longer term commitment in the nature of some 20 year horizons and more targeted in terms of the way that they approach it. Some other universities will be transmogrified, as it were, into specialist research universities across all states and located in selected regional uh, areas. There may be up to a dozen of these 
or around that sort of number, and each would have their own specialist research focus and a small number of broad discipline areas not duplicated elsewhere. And in some ways, these might be similar in concept to the current National Protocols University classification of a university with a specialist, uh, specialised status. Interestingly, no university with this status has yet been approved, but perhaps this could be redefi a redefined category and a, u a university mission. The other category of tertiary provider would in effect be a new cre creature blending, uh, blending other existing universities where the primary emphasis would be on teaching at degree and post-degree levels with a view to professional employment outcomes for graduates. Joining this group would be a, <coughs> a several selected TAFE institutes rebadged as polytechnics delivering tertiary courses at diploma and degree levels, again with professional employment outcomes for graduates. Resourcing for research carried out in these providers would be much more outcome focused with providers unique areas of specialty, uh, especially as uh, authorised in their distinctive missions for their uh, institutions. Resourcing for researchers should, in my view, be of a shorter period and typically would be around targeted disciplines as in, uh, such as industries and involve highly collaborative approaches. However, it would need to recognise scholarly research as part of the general funding rate for the tertiary teaching by these providers. And of course, underpinning this structure would be other TAFE institutes and community colleges and RTOs generally. And within this, we would suggest that there should be a further separating of the VET sector so that the large RTOs are not subject to the lowest common denominator public policy and reg regulations. And the value of regional and rural TAFE provision is recognised, valued and funded. One person, one, one man's opinion, uh, one institute's opinion, and it may be wishful thinking. But then again, things happen, and sometimes happen quickly in this country, sometimes not so quickly too. I've introduced the concept of uh, polytechnic college or even polytechnic university, and what do we mean by that and the role of research in them? Polytechnics exist already in the tertiary band of tertiary institutions overseas. Traditionally, polytechnics have been recognised as being providers of more technical higher education, courses when compared to those offered by universities and polytechnic colleges have an educational focus that promotes the ready application of knowledge to practical and industry specific circumstances. The role of research within these institutions is often concerned with identifying, advancing and promoting practical learning opportunities to enable students to engage with industry and the research undertaken is of highly applied nature concentrated on achieving outcomes that assist with the development or growth of products, processes or services and it's often about business sustainability or competitiveness, about productivity or about innovation at an enterprise level. The research may also be said to be applied in nature in the sense that it functions to inform ongoing teaching practices, ensuring a currency of discipline specific knowledge, as well as a pedagogical concepts and delivery models. And the applied research undertaken through the polytechnic model from pure and basic research traditionally conducted through universities. Historically, such university-based academic research is often highly theoretical in nature in comparison uh, uh, to this, although of greater benefit to the uh, community in the longer term. The applied polytechnic research is often conducted in, in partnership with the industry, external academics and other relevant community organisations. And through this uh, uh, partnership and applied research, it is strengthened through the attainment of the objective as being potentially of benefits to both parties. So I would put forward the assertion in line with TDA's position that whilst continuing to focus on teaching excellence, the new Australian Polytechnic would also have research, but not as traditionally defined by the university sector. It would be more aligned to scholarship research that addresses industry relevance and currency skill shortages and gaps and regional workforce development. In Germany, for example, the applied research undertaken through Polytechnics is often funded in large part by industry partners because of the perceived benefit to industry and the potential for commercial application uh, of the research. In this partnership arrangement for polytechnics, the advancement of knowledge through the research might be considered of greater va value from a pedagogical or in intellectual pers perspective. Polytechnics in Canada, Britain and New Zealand all undertake applied research, which is seen as an integral part of the provision of the high quality, relevant and responsive educational courses to students studying at all qualification levels. The big problem for VET, my area, is that our own research community needs, uh, <coughs> needs to get better at articulating our story and the positive outcomes of the research that we uh, do. Only last week, uh, a week or so ago at the NCVR research conference, 
Elizabeth McGregor, one of our New South Wales TAFE CEOs, opinion that, that and she's from New, North Coast uh, TAFE, uh, that uh, VET was failing to tell its research story within the context of major political reforms that we're undergoing, especially with the Gill Gillard government viewing education as a primary driver of economic productivity. Now, Elizabeth pointed to the rich and diverse picture which is VET and the value and power of the system to contribute if only the VET system could sharpen its focus and quality of its research. As my university colleagues here would know, this all takes money and investment and there's very little of that in our system at the present time, unfortunately. Perhaps Frank Larkin's got it right in his analysis published by the LH Martin Institute last week when he pointed out the dependence of many universities on revenue from fee paying overseas students to subsidise research and teaching activity. He pointed to high student st staff ratios and the casualisation of the teaching workforce and concludes that this cross subsidisation has serious implications for quality and he's rightly concerned about these. However, what I did note particularly in the report of his finding is the linking of the need to, to score well in international rankings in the overseas market. The higher, rank, the, the higher you rank, the more students you are interested. A challenge for the university sector, and I know this is forcing many of you to review how you market yourself and just what you claim as your specialisations. So turning to funding and what uh, happens there, desirably demand-driven funding uh, is, uh, is going to be uh, applying to universities in uh, 2012. And this should be open to non-university higher education providers so that Commonwealth supported places are also available to uh, uh, those providers as well. It's incongruous to talk of a higher education system in which pro uh, provider participation is uh, subject to strict regulatory conditions and now there is one regulator for all higher education providers and yet deny those providers and their potential students who meet all of the quality assurance requirements access to the funding system which titles itself demand driven. In the current circumstances and under the current policy, student demand is not driving the uh, system, it's being stifled. Similarly, a different and more inclusive approach will need to be taken to the higher education participation and partnerships program, to the capital grants, to the EF funding and also to the general rate of higher level uh, qualifications and the co Commonwealth uh, supported places as they need to allow for the uh, scholarly research and also for HEP, uh, private HEP access to CSP places. Now it may sound far-fetched as academics uh, to you that usually uh, you're learning from each other, learning from research that you do and innovation with the industry partners. However, there may be a salient lesson that can be drawn from the sporting world. At the elite level, and some would say university researchers at the elite level of, uh, uh, <coughs> of uh, the university education, at the elite level of sports, Australia was doing very well in the 50s, 60s and 70s. And you may recall the major loss of global standing Australia suffered when we did not win a gold medal at the 1976 Olympics. It was this catastrophe that saw the federal government establish the Australian Institute of Sport, which is now renowned, a renowned developer of our elite sports people and undertakes a very important research in this uh, sporting field. To complement this, we've now seen state sport institutes created, which usually focus around some specialised sports. And in addition, with uh, individual sports such as football, tennis, cricket, have established their own national sporting academies. Specialist single sports academies, uh, although we're now seeing collaborations across tier one sports in this area. And of course, they're supported by a number of uh, universities as well. But what we've seen is outstanding improvements in performance and results as a consequence of this. This is not dissimilar to the model I'm putting forward for uh, our research. It took a major loss of global credibility to stimulate such a change. As a professional in the academic field, I would not want to see a Montreal performance as being necessary to activate our federal government uh, <coughs> to uh, uh, in appropriately resourcing our whole tertiary sector, respecting the contribution of academic researchers and academic teachers in the broad tertiary education industry. In short, what does this mean for funding of research and the funding of teacher teaching? The answer remains to be seen, but one thing is for sure, the outcome needs to accommodate a system of providers restructured to meet the needs of students, employers and the nation generally. One that enables this nation to be creative and yet at the same time improve our competitiveness, productivity and well-being. 
and as part of this outcome needs to be in, include provision for funding of CSPs and applied research activities in TAFE institutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, John. But both of our speakers have um, focused in, in a way on diversity. Um, and <clears throat> of course there are funding implications for diversity too. Uh, we will now open up um, our seminar for comment and also for questions. There may be some points which people would like clarified. We have some roving microphones <clears throat> or people with microphones who will rove around the room. Um, I would ask if you want to ask a question or make a comment, would you please uh, mind giving your name and any institution affiliation that you have? So, given that the furniture is almost arranged, uh, please. <laughs> Uh, questions and comments to either Martin or to John or indeed to both. Thank you. One, two, yes, one here first, Lisa. Yeah. It was a speed factor rather than anything else, yes. Thank you. Andrew Norton, University of Melbourne. A question for John. Uh, in the past, I've been looking at the fees charged by TAFE to their higher okay. education students. I can't remember precisely if Box Hill was among them, but often they were charging fees that were well below what a university would receive in total for a Commonwealth supported place. So my question is, does that reflect the underlying cost structures? And really what I'm getting at here is if you don't have the research, is it much cheaper to provide higher education on a teaching only basis? I think that if you uh, look at our, our fee structure, you'll find that uh, um, we, we are comparable, we're probably about a 15 to 20 per cent uh, below the university uh, when you're going and we've mapped, we've mapped that across obviously uh, as we're uh, going through. But it is also very difficult to do an exact comparison of those on the basis that we took a, um, a, a strategic decision that we were going into courses where, that were distinctively different to what our unit, we have very strong university partnerships with uh, with Deakin, uh, with uh, Australian Catholic University La Trobe and Monash University now, and uh, so what we've done is we've looked at how we position our degree programs within there and the pathways that are doing it. So they are cheaper, but what it means is is that uh, that we're uh, uh, we're uh, not funding that research component to the level we believe we should be. We are still funding it to that level because uh, we see it as integral as part of it, uh, part of the uh, need to move into that uh, that area. Does that? Yeah. Would you like to comment at all on that? Okay. Lisa, thank you. Um, I'm Lisa Wheelahan <coughs> from um, the LH Martin Institute. I've got a question for each um, speaker. Um, for Martin, you seem to um, put forward a model which tightly linked teaching and research. Um, for the group of eight universities. It was also a very expensive model. Do you think that this um, model should apply to the rest of the university sector? And if it should, how can we afford it? And my, my, my question for John is, in my opinion, the TAFEs are in a hiding to nothing if they think that they can get um, access um, to research funding. Isn't there a more important distinction to be made between research and scholarship and isn't scholarship the thing on which there should be no surrender? Okay, Lisa, uh, let me start uh, with an, a, a more general statement. I do not think that uh, all universities should be equal. Uh, I think there are distinct roles and uh, as John has pointed out, you, I think according to the mission of each university, you, you have to distinguish the way the university approaches this task. The group of eight universities are certainly world leading in their research. This 
is an outstanding feature which should also be and is reflected in the teaching. This is what I would call, blame me for this wording, but I think it is an elite education you get at these universities. <laughs> uh, this implies also that there are none less valuable, important teaching activities which aim at a different level. And uh, therefore, from my point of view, uh, the, the nexus between active uh, leading edge research and the appropriate teaching can only apply to a certain number of institutions or a collaboration amongst these institutions with others. And they there should be uh, an openness for these collaborations to improve the overall efficiency of the system. But again, let me stress, it requires that you have some established, experienced, attractive uh, leading institutions. If you try to to lower the standard uh, to be ready for all, one system for all, I think this will not contribute significantly to a positive societal development. When you lead a plea for this distinction, of course, you will have a discussion on the distribution of limited funds. That's obvious. But I think if there is goodwill and a common sense on all sides, you will find a reasonable compromise. My answer to your question, uh, Lisa, is, is uh, I don't believe that, um, that TAFEs would be going for the type of research that perhaps you're inferring that's there. I don't think that we, we certainly are not looking to be competing with, uh, with Melbourne University, here at Melbourne University, Monash for, for their, and the very, very fact of what Martin was saying is, and what I was advocating was even greater classification, uh, diversity and classifications yeah. of institutions and then funding accordingly. And at the level that we would be talking about is we really believe that there should be some funding for the academic scholarship component part put into the funding rate of the CSPs, not just for us, but also across for the universities that are doing the teaching, predominantly teaching. But what we should do is have access to that. And also then what we could do is look at the various grants that are existing both federally and state at the moment that are spread everywhere that are supporting some of the SMEs in some of the developments, some of the industry specific grants that are there. And if there was some bundling of those and then you looked at those new categories, I think that we could get a better outcome both for this state and also for the nation. Margaret, yes. Over here. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret Mazzolini from Swinburne. Um, picking up on Lisa's comment and perhaps taking it a little bit further, or perhaps too far, I support the ideas about scholarship wholeheartedly. S scholarship in, t in higher education is not only about keeping up with the discipline in the field or the scholarship in terms of teaching approaches, but it's also means that the teaching staff are modelling some of the basic skills we need from higher ed graduates into industry as well as into academia. How do we take that idea of perhaps wrapping the funding for scholarship into CHP, which TAFEs may or may not get, um, if we talk about scholarship requirements for private providers too, just to take it one step further, private providers in higher ed, I'm interested in responses to that. <coughs> By, uh, what, what, we would, what we would be arguing is, is A, part of the base rate, but also that part of it, it becomes part of a multiplier effect in that we would be seeing is the relationship that we have with industry and if you have industry then funding and you've got some of the uh, buckets of money that are currently there that presently are, are used, particularly I'm looking at state level obviously as, as well as at the federal level, and what you're doing is looking at leveraging that 
into the actual industry itself. And, and look, and recognising some of the innovation that is taking place. If you look at the body of knowledge, for example, that the work that we've just been doing in, uh, uh, that in Southeast Asia with the workforce development, which is, which is some leading, leading research in enterprise-based education and workforce development. We started with Venetian Sands, the largest casino in the world. Uh, there we trained 2,500 people in four months getting into, uh, to get their workforce ready to get their business operating. We then moved into Marina Sands in, uh, in, uh, in Singapore and modified the whole of that model and the approach to workforce development in a totally new way to get their, their casino up absolutely up and running. But then now, what we've then gone into the galaxy and we've taken it into a full simulation model which is not replicated any, anywhere else in the world. So we've been gradually building up that body of knowledge of workforce development there. Yet we're not, we don't have, we're not capturing that here in Australia. We're not bringing that back and getting the benefit here in, in Victoria for our own businesses that are here or for the business there. We should have a way of doing that. Now, and at the present time, we don't have any, any mechanisms for resourcing that because our customer is paying for that at the present time. So all we're doing is building up that and we're commercialising that as a, as a product for ourselves, but we should be able to commercialise that more for the benefit of, of Australia. If I just may pick up the galaxy, which uh, triggers one aspect. I, I don't know to what extent you are familiar with the uh, project of the Square Kilometre Array, uh, which, so to say, faces the same problem, John, you described, but on a different level, where you talk about the, for instance, the IT technology of the next, yeah, far next generation um, and you do not at the moment have the theoretical framework for even thinking about the implementation of these technologies which will be necessary to make uh, or bring the SKA to a practical use. Uh, the same with uh, the energy supply. You, you might know that uh, the SKA aims at uh, being supplied to 724 with solar energy, which is about 150 megawatts. Uh, it's an order of magnitude which has not been demonstrated yet anywhere in the world. So these technological developments then lead, once there are solutions, they, they need implementation. And they need to be, so to say, made practical in the end. This certainly does require a different skills set and a different qualification as compared to establishing the theoretical and uh, experimental framework for the appropriate technologies. And, and, and taking that further, to so giving that example that you gave, that was talking about in the Galaxy, it's where we were taking, we took people that were from China and some of the uh, disadvantaged regions that were there, brought them in, trained them in, in the uh, workforce. But what we then did was for two weeks before, we set up a, a, set up a simulation with four, four hotels and we were operating that. We created um, a credit card system, we created false money and we brought in customers for all of the beds there and at every one of the operational outlets that were there, we had customer experience surveys that were then fed in overnight, scanned in, and the manager of each, each particular outlet was given a feedback uh, the next day, as was the training manager and the HR development manager. And what we did was we were able to identify hotspots of any area where the customer experience hadn't been a, a positive customer experience and sent in training teams to actually do the development. So it's a, it's a, it's a model that that we look at and when they were looking, uh, when they're looking at there in the, all of that casino development, it's not, they haven't got that anywhere else in the world that they're doing. Yet we're not capturing that sort of thing as part of our innovation, which we should be doing here in Australia. Yes, so down here, anyone else waiting? And then over there, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Colin. Um, thanks, Joyce. Uh, I'll put, I'll put a set of propositions to you and we'll see how they run, uh, more or less as, as Lisa did. Uh, 
I mean, I, I mean, I think that most of us would would agree that teaching research nexus doesn't work as a universal principle. Uh, I mean, even the examples you gave, Martin, were highly selective within the G of eight context. The advanced programs, people with with ATARs above a ninety eight, and so mm. on. Um, relatively easy to argue the case when that's what we're talking about. We can talk about undergraduates being involved in original inquiry if we're talking about certain kinds of pro nested programs and certain kinds of undergraduates, but it's not that simple within the G of eight context, let alone everywhere. Um, and, and research is such an ambiguous word. I mean, so many activities come under that heading that we can't really uh, uh, um, lodge, a, lodge a consistent nexus around the word research, let alone, and the word teaching has its problems as well. Um, I, I guess this points to the fact that, that abstract principles aren't a very effective way of, 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 of organising an education system. You need programs and, and arrangements and money, you know, to organise an, a, a, a division of labour. Um, I agree with those who argue that teaching and scholarship is nexus is integral, perhaps to all tertiary teaching and maybe secondary teaching as well. Um, that doesn't solve the problem either, because uh, a lot of what we're talking about is also goes to lower level inquiry. I mean, goes to forms of applied research which involve new knowledge. Uh, it's that kind of nexus often in professional and occupational training areas that we might want to encourage. So it's not just going to be scholarship, even if we're excluding the area of high budget, big science and so on. Um, I also agree with, with, with Martin that we shouldn't treat all institutions as equivalent, and I think this is a core issue, uh, and maybe one that divides the two excellent speakers. Um, uh, I, I think the, the point is we shouldn't treat, tr treat institutions as equivalent, not that we shouldn't treat institutions as equal. I mean, they're not equal within the G of eight. I mean, there's a lot of difference in role and mission and activity and profile between Adelaide and Queensland, for example, without mentioning local, exam local cases. Um, but equivalence, the, the issue is equivalence of mission, I think, you know, whether we want one mission in, in higher education uh, or we want to permit a variation of formal mission. I mean, that's the issue that Australia has not been able to bite the bullet on, um, yet we've bitten the bullet in a very dramatic way, as John rightly points out, by having a very sharp mission differentiation between VET and higher education. So sharp that it holds VET, imprisons VET, and, and holds it well short of its potential, and I think my, I generally agree with the, the thrust of John's argument. Um, I also think that Martin is right to hint at the idea that we need to build larger scale research concentrations in universities we hope to be globally competitive. This is an issue Australia has great difficulty with. It, there's no, as Glenn said the other day, there's no real support for this in the public, in the public culture, and the policy makers aren't particularly interested either, although you know, the head of the Prime Minister's Department said the other day that we should have a university in the top ten in the world. So occasionally you get those kinds of comments. But right now we're not competitive for that level. And arguably a globally effective nation and globally effective major cities need those kinds of major players in, in terms of the circuit of world knowledge. Um, so once you start with those premises, I think you arrive at the conclusion that you're both correct that both positions are supportable. Um, we need to build concentrations. We need mission differentiation between universities and we need to make that stick and make it work. And we also need to bring VET into the modern era and allow it formally to conduct research of a supported kind, not just applied research that it arranges with industry, but they sh it should have access to formal programs. And if you look at international examples, you find that both of those premises are widely supported internationally. There is wide support internationally for concentration in particular research universities. It's better done on the basis of merit in programs than it is by giving money straight to institutions, um, which, which tends then to run into uh, internal allocation issues uh, and status problems and all those sorts of things. But, but it is widely supported internationally, even if it's not in Australia. And there's also wide support internationally for second sectors, polytechnics, uh, whatever we call them, doing research, doing funded research. The Dutch institutions have now got access to it, the Germans do it. I mean, you know, there's, there's a whole range of examples of the Finns. You can talk about a number of cases in Europe especially. So what, it seems no good reason why we don't do both those things. But to be able to do both those things, we need to have more than one research program. At the moment, we've got one kind of research funding system. You're either in it or you're not. VET is not in it. If you are in it, you compete either in a strong position like Melbourne and Queensland or in a weak position like Sunshine Coast and, and Ballarat. 
and you know, and 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 you perpetually fail to to, to get traction in that competition. Uh, if Ballarat and, and 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 Sunshine Coast and James Cook had access to specific regional funding programs, it would all make a bit more sense. If VET had access to VET targeted research programs, VET could enter the modern era and would start to have more PhD trained academics, which is a key constraint in capacity. Um, it's our inability, I think, to formalise mission differentiation to, um, and that's our problem and we lack a robust classification system. If we had a robust classification system, as the Europeans are doing, all of these things would become possible. Thank you. Do you have a comment? <laughs> That's no no small order. <laughs> no small order. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You may comment if you want. No, yes. What, of my, my only my only addition to that would be is that, that to make what you're saying, we would agree. I would agree with uh, the propositions you're putting forward. The only thing I would say is that we have to grow the cake. I think I think that that, that uh, but which is which is implicit in what you're saying. But but I don't think I don't think that you can divide the cake. Is, is, is where I, what would be the only additional comment I would say to that. Yep. My, uh, I fully agree. Uh, my comment would be, and I'm very grateful uh, because I see this seminar or this seminar series as a contribution to that. I think in Australia a public debate on the role of higher education is lacking. So what does the society at large expect from the higher education as such as a contribution to the societal development in the longer term perspective than, uh, uh, well, a budget year. And this, I think, if, if this can contribute to such a debate, it is a very, very useful and urgently needed larger debate because then all your questions would eventually be answered. You would hope so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, common sense suggests uh, if the uh, political debate continues uh, on the level of quality we see at the moment, I perhaps may have some doubts. And, and my concern also would be that the current set of protocols that have come out under te uh, TEXA, I don't need, think, believe, take us to where we need to be going into the future. I think that it's narrowed down the level of provision, uh, provider classification. It's also put barriers up. It's even put the, the hurdle up even higher in terms of saying that a, a private private provider uh, is only in one category. There's five categories for university the, that are in, the, in, the, in there. And that's limiting with a sort of uh, level of growth that I think that we should and the, the debate and the discussion. And I think that, heaven forbid, if ASCA and TEXA do come together, if they do come together, uh, that's, uh, that's there, then I hope that we take the opportunity nationally to actually start to redress some of this and, and uh, look at the classification structures. Okay, so thank you. John, we have Richard, then we have Madeline, Madeline, and then another question over here. So we have three lined up for the moment. Thanks, thank Joyce. You. Um, welcome. Richard James from the Centre for the Study of Higher Education. Uh, my question now looks like a, a footnote to Simon's <laughs> to Simon's paper, <laughs> um, and it's, it's really a comment about metrics, and the logic goes like this, I think. I, mean, I think it's clear from the discussion that for some reason or other we're, we're resistant to institutional differentiation and we're also resistant to differentiation in the, the work of our academic and teaching staff. And some of the barriers here are related to policy, some of the barriers are related to, to funding and others are cultural barriers to do with our assumptions about the nature of our organisations. What we're trying to move towards, I think, is a more differentiated notion of research in which we probably can't risk using the research word all the time because it has so many uh, assumptions around it and so much baggage. So we start using various expressions such as pure and applied, such as even uh, knowledge transfer or community engagement, and as Lisa pointed out, scholarship. Now, looking at this in a hard-nosed kind of way, it seems to me that we would only make progress towards a more differentiate, differentiated notion of this thing that's something to do with research if we had trusted metrics around whether or not we're getting it. 
In other words, you know, politicians will want to know if they are funding scholarship, for example, how do you know when you've got it? And how do you know when you haven't got it? Now, we have enough problems trying to measure capital R research at the moment. So my question to, to Lisa and Simon and the panel, if they're interested, <laughs> is, you know, what would we need to do metrics-wise to ensure that our in institutional leaders and our politicians have, have confidence in a more differentiated notion of, of research? Martin or John? Or indeed Simon or Lisa? <coughs> well, um, Richard, trusted metrics is... Uh, yeah, uh, it's Pandora's box you open here. But um, from my point of view, it goes beyond trusted metrics. It uh, addresses trust. Um, if, so to say, a system requires constant reporting and justification, you end up in a general mistrust, which society again reflects in the mistrust towards the system as such. And you see tendencies like this, for instance, in the uncollege movement in the United States. Uh, the, the question is, to what extent can you regain public trust in a system. This is largely related to the expectations you link to higher education investments. It is, I think, a very reasonable question uh, you should ask every student investing time and money whether this is a wise investment or if he or she could enter the labor market on a shorter term uh, training scheme. So th these issues, as uh, I am convinced of, need a broader debate leading to the question, what kind of society in Australia do we want in 15, 20 years' time? in a very dynamic global um, development, because none of this, what we discuss here, is static. Um, yeah, and I, I do not know how long we are in a position where we have the options to make rational decisions on restructuring the system, because there are countries around the world who are not in a position to fund any changes anymore. They are just closing institutions. And this is something where I think we should make the best use of the time and the advantageous economical development to enter into such a debate and to come up with solutions which are really forward-looking and opening perspectives for the individuals, for the young people, not only here in the country, around the world, uh, because I think Australia is, is very attractive in terms of the societal context and the possibilities it offers uh, at the moment. So let's make the best out of that. That would be my answer uh, to the metrics. My answer to it would, uh, would be is that, that I would totally agree with you uh, with it. It's interesting when we see, we get bipartisan agreement that uh, we want a world class, and partic particularly if we talk about VET, a world class VET, uh, VET uh, system that's there. When you ask what is a world class uh, system and what we need to do to move to it, they talk about uh, things such as we want excellence in uh, uh, vocational education and training, we want you to be more responsive, more flexible. And that was the gist of what came out at the Skills Australia conference. Industry was saying we want you to be more responsive, more flexible. So we asked then the public uh, policy makers, what do you mean by excellence? 
What do you mean by world class? So, uh, 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 what do you mean by excellence? What do you mean by responsiveness and flexible, uh, flexibility? Where are we now? Can you, what are the matrix for, metrics for uh, doing that? And what we see is, and what we uh, see come up in all of our uh, service agreements is student contact hours, module completion rates, asset utilisation rates, uh, uh, working capital rates. Uh, I'm not sure, I don't know if I'm talking to educationalists, uh, that doesn't resonate with my academics within, the, uh, within our organisation. So we have to have more of a discussion about what is the metrics that uh, the government uh, and the community uh, sees and the industry sees, what, what our academic leaders uh, see and, uh, and what, uh, uh, what our students uh, see as being the, uh, uh, the, the metrics of excellence in education and training for them. Yeah, Sharon Carlton from Swinburne University. Thank you. John, the um, evidence of e excellence that you were questioning, student contact hours, modulo completion rate, that kind of thing, um, that is more about evidence of compliance with regulatory requirements. I'm maybe where the gap is, is that in providing evidence on the capability of the organisation, it does tend to get limited, especially in the VET sector, to those compliance aspects. Where And, and is it then a case that research, as is it's, it is known in the higher education sector, and quality teaching and learning is that that is something else. There is an added something else, the creativity, the knowledge base, the growth, the new ideas that is not something you can measure or quantify in responding to your, um, the, responding to the government in demonstrating you've met your contractual obligations for your funding base. And I, I suspect that maybe this is where the gap and the opportunity, part of the gap and opportunity may lie. I, I, uh, I, have, I have to apologise if I haven't communicated well enough. Uh, what I was saying was we are talking about excellence, we're talking about world-class education, yet the government, so I'm saying it's inappropriate that what it is is that the, the government then funds you and measures you solely on the basis of student contact hours, all of those other things. I'm saying that there needs to be a discussion and there needs to be some form of agreement as to what are some of the metrics that are actually educational in nature. And we need to have a discussion about that. And it may be about some parts of the process of it. It may be in, in the VET area, it may be the responsiveness to market from when, uh, when there is industry requiring change in program development. There may be the, the workforce participation rate. There, there may be a whole range of other measures, but we need to have the discussion and the debate about it. And we're not having that at the present time. The discussion and the debate is still about efficiency measures and, uh, and about throughput measures that are there and, and widgets instead of uh, about educational things. That's what I'm, uh, that's what I'm saying. On, uh, Margaret is your... Not metrics. OK, so we'll move on from metrics if, if we may. But, I th but for me, I think that discussion was really important in getting to trust and then in getting to some of the communication aspects about what we do. So how then do we have the sorts of discussions that need to be had with the people with whom we need to have them? That's the key, I think, uh, engaging people who can make a difference, people in positions of influence in the ways that we need to, not necessarily, not necessarily politicians. Uh, Madeline, I think, was next, and then one over here. Yeah, OK. Still on track. Um, We've come back to the track. My name is Madeleine Loming, and I'm from Australian Catholic University. Thank you to both of the speakers. It's been a, a, a most mm -hmm. stimulating discussion so far, and I'm intrigued at the um, inclusion of university on the one hand and VET, TAFE, on the other. I should own up quickly that I'm, although I do work in a university, I am associated with adult community and further education, so I kind of have a foot in both camps. But I want to pick up on assumptions which Richard mentioned a few minutes ago. Until very, very recently, um, a number of the world's most elite universities were not particularly strong at research. Their reputations for hundreds of years relied upon their teaching. And until, as I said, quite recently, some of the best known, uh, highest ranked universities in the world were not 
known for research. What then does this say for the status of teaching only institutions here in Australia? Why does research have to take place in universities? Uh, you mentioned, uh, John, you mentioned private uh, providers. Uh, what's the role of private providers in engaging in very high levels of research, which they do overseas? Um, and here's the biggie. What's the distinction between universities and something else? What is the nature, to paraphrase, what is the nature of university? <laughs> <laughs> right, Millie. <clears throat> Good question. Um, now, let yeah, status. That that's the right thing. Let let's look back a couple of hundred years um, and think about, say, the 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 pre-French Revolution, academic. Uh, these were learned men. Uh, which did not pursue a single discipline. They were universalists, some more in the medical, some more in the theological research, some more in the legal research, some more, well, natural aspects of life. Um, with the bourgeois revolution, a new paradigm appeared which encouraged the distinction into disciplines and knowledge as a public good was promoted. That did not exist before. So this entire notion is nothing eternal. It is a rather recent creation, actually. So. We, the universities then for about 150 years played still a, an important role in the identification and the validation of national identity. The, the nation was born. That didn't exist previously either. When the whole thing got a bit more complex, the universal aspect of a university disappeared through the creation of dedicated research institutes which served the nation state. We, we still have a very big one here, one of the latest creations. A lot of them are much older. So now these existed and they were exclusively there to deliver applied research, whether it be in construction, in medical sciences, or a lot of them uh, hidden for military applications. After World War II, we had a reverse of the system because the project funding aspect was introduced. And because universities, by definition, had a higher turnover of younger brains, they came up with the better ideas and they were more competitive in the grant funding scheme, which induced a certain decline in the relevance of the research conducted in big national research institutions. One of the best examples you can look at is the French CNRS. So we are in a phase now where research is redefined again in a, in a broader societal dimension, following the dynamics of the development in this world. So I do not know whether we have reached a status where we all can be happy and say this will suffice for the coming 50 years. Personally, I have my doubts. <laughs> so the, the, these processes actually are, are going on and the allocation where, who, 
looks into what topic, I think is highly dependent on what the topic is, on the one hand, and how you network this knowledge creation in a global context, because there are so many th people thinking about different questions around this world today as there's never been before. And to, so to say, even have an overview of the knowledge created in this world today is a very difficult task which it has never been before. This evolution is very steep. Thank you. John, do you have any comment at all? My only comment would be, to, at the first part of you, I won't go over the second part, the first part of you, why are we here together uh, with the two areas? And the reason I would say is the world is changing, the market is changing that's out there, and divided we fall, together we might conquer. <laughs> And so uh, uh, we should be getting to know each other. We should be working as closely together to try and position ourselves as a tertiary education industry uh, sector there with, the, with all of the parties rather than having bickering in amongst ourselves. True, true. Good point. Thank you. And then <coughs> Gavin. Um, Brian Dalton from Swinburne University. Uh, just to pick up on the last point um, about the separation between uh, VET and universities, of course there is another approach to it which is the one that Swinburne adopts which is to have a TAFE sector within the um, university uh, structure itself. So maybe that's a way that could be looked at in the other institutions too. Um, but what I want to come back to to is this uh, general idea of what a university is about and to me it's about this uh, combination of doing research and teaching and of course I understand the distinction between research and scholarship and I'm, what I mean is research in terms of advancing knowledge and what I'm worried about is that this debate seems to be sort of uh, moving towards the idea that we ought to sort of differentiate between institutions and in a sense privilege some institutions to be the ones that do research and teaching across a broad range of disciplines. The G8 university might think that they are the only um, universities that are entitled to do this, but uh, I think the Vice-Chancellor of Macquarie University might think that his university ought to be sort of uh, maybe as good as some of the ones in the G08. Some of the universities in the uh, technology uh, um, university sector, although they're not doing research and teaching across a, as wide a range of disciplines uh, as the, some of the GOH universities, would also point to the fact that they're doing good research and good teaching within their more limited sectors. So I think it would be an artificial and counterproductive uh, approach to kind of privilege one group of institutions over others. What's wrong with the good old idea of competition. Um, I mean, for example, in uh, Swinburne University, I would claim that we have uh, one of the best astrophysics departments in Australia. In cold atom physics, we're better than Monash and Melbourne. So why should we be somehow excluded from uh, competing by some artificial uh, scheme to say, well, you're not allowed to do that because you've got to become a spoke of Melbourne or Monash as the hubs in these particular areas, as Senator Carr obviously thinks might be the way. Um, People have talked about how can you be confident that uh, what's going on is uh, being done well and we have this thing called the ERA which purports to do that. Uh, well, I think a lot of us have very little confidence that the ERA is going to actually give good adequate measures of how well the research is uh, being uh, um, achieved in these, in these areas. For example, in the new version of the ERA, there's an artificial restriction that you've got to have 50 outputs in any particular four-digit code to even have your research recognised. Well, surely this is a, a hidden agenda to sort of privilege uh, people uh, in big institutions because there'll be a lot more people in those areas. Their research will be actually measured. People who are doing just as good research in the smaller institutions but don't have the numbers will just be sort of uh, made invisible. So if you really want to do something about uh, having a, um, an open and, and uh, fair competition, which is what I would advocate, I think the ERA needs significantly more reforms. And that's my point of view. Thank you. Uh, comments? Do you have a comment on well, the points uh, about competition? One, one point, I, I uh, think that uh, 
the ERA was or is a good exercise for a very particular purpose that is to compare on purely academic standards. Uh, that purpose is served. I think one should not use the results of the ERA for interpretations or activities or political decision making, which it is not meant to be for. So uh, the, the danger with these uh, assessments, with these rankings, always is that they are misused. I think the ERA as such is a very interesting exercise in itself uh, for Australia to, to, to look into the internal structures and uh, draw conclusions on the institutional level. But it is very difficult, for instance, from my personal point of view, to link the ERA results to base funding classification. Uh, the ERA is an academic overview over the past X years, what happened in an institution, in different faculties. And the institution can use these results to draw conclusions, whether they want to invest more or less in a certain area. But um, the danger, and, and here I agree absolutely with you, is that these surveys, these assessments are used for other decision-making uh, background. Thank you, the, 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 point, the point I was making was that uh, I don't believe with what is going on uh, nationally in terms of our funding, when you look at the level of floods that we've had, the level of fires, the, all of the uh, adjustments that are going to happen, <clears throat> I don't think that the funding is going to continue on in an open, in an uncapped manner into uh, ad finitum that's there. What I would, therefore, if that's the case, then we need to be positioning ourselves as a sector as to what we really want to have happen when that changes. And what I, what I was putting forward was, was one of the things that we should be doing is looking at changing the base funding model, which is part of the review that's going on at the present time, to get some uh, academic scholarly re scholarship recognised within that funding model. But also that what we need to do is, is currently government policy, a lot of government policy is short term policy and uh, that's there because of political cycles. And I believe that what we should be doing if, if we want to get to world-class, rec world-recognised uh, research institutions, we cannot have all 28 doing that, is my view, because as a country we cannot afford to support that. On the basis of that, therefore, we need to be able to work out how many we can have and we need to fund them, but we need to give them funding that is long-term funding that goes over a lot, uh, 20 years to give, and I'm saying 20 years, it might be 15, it might be 30, whatever, have the debate about that. But give them the certainty, give them the ability to build that capability in a sustainable way, rather than doing it the way that we're currently doing at the present time. Thank you. I think we're moving <coughs> towards our, our closing. I know we have one more comment or question. We have two more. Any advance on two? Okay, fine. Gavin, thank you. Uh, Gavin Moody, RMIT. Um, Martin and Leo Gudeberg can help us on this, but I don't think that Australian TAFE institutes look anything like German Fachhochschulen or indeed uh, Dutch HBOs. It seems to me they look much more like Berufs Academy mm -hmm. or MBOs. If you want the Australian analogue for Fachhochschulen, it's RMIT and similar institutions. <laughs> Further, I would say, yes, the Australian government, uh, Commonwealth and state, fund the sports academies to achieve gold medals in Olympics, not to improve the fitness and well-being the of the Australian <laughs> Academy. <laughs> it's precisely true, true, the opposite. True. It's precisely the opposite for research. 
Australian governments do not fund research to win gold medals. They do not fund research to win Nobel Prizes. They fund research to improve the well-being and in particular the economic well-being of the country. That is innovation as we now say. And that argues for an entirely different structure of research funding than that which is argued by analogy from the Sports Academy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, comments at all from either speaker? <coughs> well, I would, I, would, I would argue that there, there is a lot of, um, still, I still would use the analogy that's uh, there with the Australian Sports Commission, because when you look at the flow on effect that has happened as a consequence of that, at the, at the research level, that has happened in terms of the sports. They have funded the, into there a, a whole lot of additional research that is about wellbeing, that is in, in the Australian Institute of Sport. If you look at the, some of the material that has flowed back out, that has uh, been about grassroots uh, uh, participation, some of the sports programs that have come there, because what they're doing is they're looking and saying, by funding that, they are building the base of a pyramid. And then from the base, it then comes, comes up to the, uh, the higher level. However, I can accept what you're saying in terms of the, the research that, and I said, most educationalists will not like the analogy that I, that I put uh, in uh, regards to that. But if what we are talking about doing is to getting some world-class research institutions, then in order to get world-class, you've got to be prepared to look at picking and choosing and funding a certain number and letting them move to a different level to what the others are within the pyramid. And that's basically what I, the analogy I'm saying is, I think that we need to build a very strong pyramid within Australia in terms of tertiary education, of which we will have at the top a world-class or one or two or three world-class universities that uh, will get there. Thank you. And now for our last question. It's Ah, oh, just behind you, Margaret. It's Margaret yeah. Manzalini from Swinburne. Um, following on from Gavin's point, I think, um, I think we've got to be really careful in this discussion not to be discussing framing research in the research models of the past. And we heard earlier from Martin how that's changed over the years. Martin also gave the example of the square kilometre array, which is a very instructive one, actually. That's Australia's big attempted big science at the moment. The leading players, I was a radio astronomer in previous life, the re leading players in this area, the CSIRO, straight government funded, pure, purely funded for research and development. And in fact, um, Curtin University and Swinburne University are up there too, beca not because we are teaching undergraduate astronomy, we are not, almost no one does in Australia, the world doesn't need more research astronomers, frankly, but because of the work that goes on in areas like, very applied areas like engine, electric, electronic engineering and IT. The research that's going on in those areas, it's what funding the sorts of technologies that will be able to build the SKA if we get funded for it. And John's colleagues in West Australia who will be turning out the new techniques with the trades people to actually build the thing, which is a huge leap up. So. Uh, I think I'm, I'm actually arguing against a pyramid model. I'm saying there's a horses for courses. The sorts of issues, cross-disciplinary issues like that that are tackling us, even in big science, much less areas like climate change, need different ways about thinking about research. They need research that juts over different areas and they, and they need research that isn't just in a paradigm of a few elite universities, frankly. Some areas that works, some areas it doesn't, but I think we have to be much more flexible in our thinking because the world's changing under us. And that also suggests uh, that we might need to remind ourselves from time to time about form following function, uh, which is sort of an interesting way of thinking about it too. Um, we have, I think, come to the end. If we return to our question, mutual protection or deadly enemies, uh, it seems to me that there is quite a deal of um, agreement for the proposition that they're, that they are not deadly enemies, teaching and research, that they do feed off each other, they do inform each other. And the trick 
acceptance. The challenge, I think, is, is to make sure that both teaching and research it, in the dimensions, in all of their glorious dimensions, are funded adequately. And so we go back to, someone mentioned growing the cake. I'm not quite sure how we grow the cake. Um, but it seems to me if the cake is to be grown, then we need metrics that are trusted. And we also need to make sure that community expectations are met. And for them to be met so that the cake can be grown, we ha the community has to be clear about its expectations and we have to be clear about what those expectations are and how, how realistic uh, some of those expectations of the tertiary education sector might in fact be. So in closing, can I ask you to thank um, Martin and to thank John in the usual way. Um, we, we have <laughs> Richard Hovering. A trusted metric. A, a trusted metric. There is a trusted metric. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you.